Hello there, Peter here. Welcome to our Travels Through Time YouTube page. We've got another video interview for you today. Today's interview E is the Irish journalist Ronan McGreevy. He's written this book, which is just out now. It's called Great Hatred, The Assassination of Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson MP. For those of you who know early 20th century history, the story might be instantly apparent. For those of you who do not, well, this is a really fundamental one in the formation of the modern state of Ireland and it takes us back exactly pretty much 100 years to the day. Um, I spoke to Ronan last week in anticipation of the anniversary and he took me back to 1922. I hope you enjoy it. Grievy, it's a real pleasure to be having you uh, here on our podcast today. Um, when you're not busy writing books, you're a news reporter with the Irish Times. So I thought it'd be really good if you could just begin by telling us a little bit about your professional background and your journalistic in interests as well, please. Well, I'm, I'm uh, a journalist with the Irish Times. I'm also a videographer. I do video for the newspaper. I've been in journalism for 30 years. I... Uh, have also been a producer with the BBC and Sky News. I worked in the UK for nine years too. So I would have worked with the Evening Standard and the Times newspaper. Um, I've been writing books basically about the Irish decade of centenaries, which is the, the years between 1912 and 1922. My first book was published in 2016 called Wherever the Firing Line Extends. I've been uh, involved in either editing or writing books ever since. And my newest one is uh, great hatred, the assassination of Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson MP, which we're talking about today. Yeah, we'll get to it in a minute. Um, there's a few more general questions that I'd like to ask you yeah. whilst I've got the opportunity. And um, it's nice that you bookend what essentially is a really um, formative decade in Irish history, this, this kind mm. of decade between 1912 and 1922. Yeah. And I was just thinking about this, speaking as an Englishman from, um, you know, someone sitting in London at the moment, grown up in the late 20th, early 21st centuries, islands always seem to have a slightly elusive nature to me. So, for example, Irish stories don't usually make it into the English media and um, even just kind of quite fundamental things like uh, Ireland's geography, for example, seem to uh, kind of escape a lot of my friends here. And I was talking to someone from Kerry the other day and they were having to describe where Kerry was, for example. And I was just thinking what a complete turnaround this is from a century ago when Ireland was absolutely at the centre of political debate. It was in the newspapers every day. Um, mm. Is that right? You know, that kind of general yeah, sense absolutely. of change? Yes, it was. I mean, back in the 19, uh, early, from I'd say about 1870 until 1922, Ireland had a disproportionate impact on, on British uh, affairs. Um, Churchill once lamented, why, why, does this, why does this issue just keep coming up? Why does it shake mm -hmm. our, the foundations of our government? Because at the time, you know, uh, Ireland was approximately um, maybe 10% of the British population, and yet it seemed to be half the time was spent dealing with Irish matters. And part of the um, what happened 100 years ago was an attempt by the British government to get rid of Ireland as an issue once and for all, hence the setting up of Northern Ireland in 1921, followed uh, swiftly on by the establishment of the Irish Free State in 1922. And there was a belief then that as far as the British was concerned, the issue was solved gone from the table you know and here we are still 100 years later talking about the um northern ireland protocol and about partition and about prospect of united ireland the breakup of the united kingdom so it's 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 as uh, uh it's like the poor it's still with us you know <laughs> i know it's it, and in a way that connects to what i was saying with this general sense of elusive elusivity with ireland and it seems for example, with the whole Brexit um, palaver, that it is Ireland upon which the whole um, riddle is becoming unstuck again. Um, well, absolutely it is. And I mean, there's a general feeling in Ireland. <clears throat> I mean, somebody once said that Britain is 99% of Ireland's history and, and Ireland is 1% of Britain's history. Now, it's a little bit more complicated, but that but the reality is, is Britain, oh, we in Ireland know an awful lot more about Britain than Britain does about Ireland, which is just one of these quirks of being a small country on the edge of a big one. The problem is when you have something like Brexit, where there seemed to be a complete lack of understanding on the part of the British political classes that the Irish people would never, ever allow for a hard border on the island of Ireland in any circumstances. And that's 
where the whole Brexit thing has foundered. And it wasn't even a consideration, so far as I could see, in the in the um, in the in the Brexit debate. So, um, you know, it, it's it's still with us. We'd all like to think that we'd all like to just get on without having all of this weight of history on our on our shoulders. Yeah, I can confirm that pretty much throughout the whole Brexit negotiations, certainly before the vote, no one mentioned Ireland once, and it was um, only very recently people started to think of the ramifications of what had been passed through. Mm-hmm. So that's a kind of interesting dynamic between mm-hmm. the two countries that we're sitting in at the moment. But yeah. um, I wanted to get on to something which is a bit more thematic, and this is, um, I'll read you a bit of um, the opening section of your own book back to you, um, because the I suppose the subject we're going to talk about today could be boiled down to political assassination, and, oh. and um, I thought it was quite striking when you write that the threat of assassination was ever present in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the Russian Tsar Alexander II, who emancipated the serfs, was killed by anarchists in 1881. Um, in 1894, Carnot, the f- president of France, was also a victim of anarchists. As four years later, was the Empress Elizabeth of Austria, the wife of the Emperor of Austri- Austria, Franz Joseph I. Then you have King Umberto of Italy, who was murdered in 1900, King Carlos of po- Portugal in 1908. Um, during this time, we have the assassination of three American presidents. There's Lincoln, Garfield and McKinley. And upon all of this history, Archduke, Archduke Ferdinand, uh, Franz Ferdinand remarks, we're all constantly in danger of death. One must simply trust in God. And of course, then he gets assassinated in 1914, as we all know. So I, I thought there was a really interesting question implicit in that statement is why at this time was political assassination so present and such a um, utilised weapon? Well, I mean, it's political assassination has been a weapon throughout history. I mean, you only have to look at the case of Julius Caesar to to see that that's the case. Um, I think that what you, what you see in the 19th century is an awful lot of countries being born out of bloodshed, Germany, France, um, you see uh, Italy being reunited in the 19th century, you see all the problems with the uh, multi-ethnic nature of the Austria-Hungarian Empire and also the Russian Empire. And all of these countries, they're they're not democracies like the United Kingdom is. They are countries uh, in in a state of foment all the time. I mean, of course, the United States is, but the United States had a gun culture from the very beginning. And obviously it went through a civil war. So um, all of these countries, uh, and that's only a small fraction of the political assassinations. They're only the major figures. But for instance, in Germany after the First World War, um, so many of the politicians who tried to pick up the pieces after the Weimar Republic, Matthias Erzberger being one of them, and, and Walter Rachnow, who was only shot dead two days after, after Wilson, all of these uh, um, guys were... The, these were the victims of, of political unrest in all of these countries. And, you know, France has a tradition of, of uh, revolution and rebellion as well. So is Portugal, Spain. The one um, country that's absent from all of this throughout the United, 19th century was was United Kingdom. I mean, obviously there was the Irish issue, but internally, you know, issues were resolved in the UK without resorting to violence. And that's why the Wilson shooting was so um, shocking to British people at the time. Now, there had been the assassination of the Chief Secretary to Ireland in 1882, but that was regarded as a sort of one-off freak event. Um, The idea of the former head of the British Army and a servant MP being gunned down on the streets of London really was a shock to a country that was just not used to political assassination. Mm, Absolutely fascinating. Well, let's get into it. So, as... Um, our regular listeners will know we we examine one year in this podcast and we go through it in three different scenes so the first question I've got to put to you of course is which year are we going to go back to have a look at today 1922 okay so 1922 I think just for um uh the, the like kind of a bit of contextual benefit it'd be good if we looked at the events that led up to 1922 in recent Irish history yeah. particularly we have um well I mean as you sketched it at the beginning, do you want to talk just about a few of the important formative events over the decade which took us 
you know, kind of maybe to the start of 1922? I know it's a very big question, but it'd be useful, I think, just to... Well, I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer it as, in as short a time as possible. So in Ireland, we're having what's called the decade of centenaries, which is, well, it's more than a decade. It's 1922 to 1923. We're commemorating those years. In those formative years in Irish history, um, it starts with the Home Rule Bill that's brought into the House of Parliament in April 1922, and it ends uh, with the end of the Irish Civil War next year. And in that time, we have the introduction of Home Rule, we have the First World War, we have the Easter Rising, we have the um, Ulster Covenant, we have after the uh, First World War is over. We had the Irish War of Independence, also known as the Anglo-Irish War, which lasts from January 1919 to July 1921. And then we have the creation of Northern Ireland, the partition of Ireland, and the, 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 the setting up of Northern Ireland in 1921, and the Anglo-Irish Treaty in, in December 1921, which ends the Irish War of Independence and, start, and creates the Irish Free State, which is now the Republic of Ireland. And that state is due to come into being uh, in, in 1922. So it's a very tumultuous period in Irish history. Um, the Anglo-Irish Treaty is meant to put an end between uh, Britain and, and, and Irish, uh, an Irish um, enmity towards each other. But it, it, it kicks off a level of enmity between uh, those people, uh, Republicans who had fought against the British in the War of Independence. They're divided over the treaty. Um, the treaty does not make Ireland an independent state, according to those who oppose it, particularly as all of those, uh, because all representatives in the Irish Parliament had to swore an oath of allegiance to the British monarch. Uh, the anti-treaty side were uh, set on an Irish an independent sovereign 32 county Irish state, and the British government uh, would not allow that. So, and, and there's a through line really from this treaty, isn't there, right through to today with the two main political parties in Ireland, you know, kind of being, I suppose, echoes of those who were for and against the treaty. Is that correct? Well, absolutely. I mean, the two big parties, they're actually in power now after almost 100 years. Fianna Fáil is, uh, is the anti-treaty side. Fine Gael is the pro-treaty side. Then you have Sinn Féin. It's a bit confusing because um, the Sinn Féin party... Uh, well, it claims it claims uh, a, a heritage going back to the original Sinn Féin party, which was formed in 1906 and split over the treaty. Um, although an awful lot of uh, a lot of historians would, would dispute that, they, they would say that the modern day Sinn Féin party uh, began in 1970. But in any case, yes, um, the three parties, the three main parties in the Republic of Ireland now are all uh, descended one way or the other from the parties that were around uh, 100 years ago. And if we were to go back to the start of January in, in maybe 1922, I think this is one of these lessons that we've learned in recent history um, of, of statecraft that, um, and often through quite traumatic experience, we can see that it's quite easy to have the war of independence. It's actually building the state afterwards, which is the problem. And, and you quote, um, let's see, I think it's Kevin O'Higgins. Yeah. yeah. And he writes of the ruins of one administration with the foundation of another, not let ye, uh, not let not yet laid and with wild men screaming through the keyhole no police force was functioning throughout the country no system of justice was operating the wheels of administration hung idle battered out of all recognition by the class of rival jurisdictions i mean i suppose when when you start drawing lines across um territory as i mean there was i suppose the division of the 20 counties and the six counties up in the, yeah. in the, in the northeast of the was there any kind of sense of migration? Um, because I know, for example, when they had partitions of India in 1947, there was kind of great migratory movements that resulted. But um, was there any of that going on in oh, Ireland? Oh, yeah, lots time? of it. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there was effectively two. While the civil, while the War of Independence was going on in the south, mostly in the south of Ireland, there was also what's called the Belfast Programs, which was... Um, sort of embryonic tr troubles, violence between 1920 and 1922, which pitted uh, loyalists against Republicans, the IRA against the British state forces, etc. So um, there had been thousands of Catholic families burned out of their homes in the south and are in the north, and they uh, came down south. And then you had families from the north from the South, Protestant families from the South who either fled up North or fled to Britain. Um, the population of Protestants in the South of Ireland um, 
uh, declining by 26% in the years between 1911 and 1926 and continued to decline after that. Now, the reasons for that are complicated, but you know, there's no doubt that there were people on both sides of the divide who were marooned in states that they didn't want to be in. And yes, there are parallels between um, India and, 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 and Pakistan, um, very, very apt parallels as it turns out. But it, it wasn't quite on the same level, I don't think, as what happened in, in, in India in 1947. Mm, but I suppose if we were to, were to distill the mood at the start of the year, right, the British um, government in Westminster uh, are kind of, I suppose, fed up after a generation of this. They feel that they've kind of come to some um, conclusion which um, w- which would solve the issues, as, as you put it. But then um, in, in reality, there's kind of a great deal to be done still. There's a new generation that needs to, to build these new states and so that's kind of i suppose where we where we lie suspended so should we go to your first scene and um, yeah. and get into the history a little bit yeah so where is it tell us whereabouts and uh, what the date would be this is the 22nd of june 1922 the the venue is liverpool street station the time is at 12 45 p.m i like your journalistic precision very very useful so what's going on at this time at this place at this time in this place, uh, Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson, the former head of the British Army, is unveiling a memorial to the 1,200 men from the Great Eastern Railway Company who, are kill- who have been killed in the First World War. Um, as we know from the First World War, there were many PALS battalions set up. Um, when the war started, many of the men from that uh, railway company would serve the east of England and was based in Liverpool Street Station. Um, they... Um, uh, served many of them in behind the scenes or behind the lines in, 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 in ensuring railways, uh, the, ensuring that, that men and material could be brought to the front, but obviously an awful lot of them were killed in the war. So Field Marshal Sir Henry Wilson is still a very prominent figure in British history. Um, he had only resigned as the uh, head of the British Army in February 1922 to become uh, a member of the, uh, to become elected as the um, M- Ulster Unionist MP for North Down. Uh, field marshals never retire or so I'm told, so he's wearing his field marshal uniform with his ceremony and sword, etc. And he's called upon to uh, unveil this memorial, which is still there to this day, by the way. Um, I'm sure a lot of your um, uh, listeners and, and viewers will, will have passed it a million times and paid no attention to it. I did myself for many years. But yes, it's still there to this day. And Liverpool Street, obviously, being one of the great um, stations, I believe it's on the Monopoly board, if I remember correctly. But it was one of those kind of great Victorian stations next yeah. to the city of London. So a great hive of activity. Um, I said, but just quickly before we get on, because I want to talk a little bit, it's a good opportunity for us to talk about Henry Wilson's biography yeah. now. But um, before that, the act of commemoration, um, this is you know, four years after the end of the, the Great War, as it was thought yes. of back then. And um, I suppose it's a society still coming to terms with what happened then. Um, it's, a, it's a generational trauma. And in fact, you know, people would not get over it. But um, there's, there's, I suppose, um, there's a quote from Wade Davis that I thought I'd mentioned this point. And it said, if the actual dead walked abreast down Whitehall, the parade would have, would have lasted for four days. So that's just the people that had died, but also many other people had, were missing and many other people were injured. They were maimed, weren't they? Well, I, I, I think it's very hard to count, countenance the, the sheer scale of loss that countries suffered in the First World War. I mean, the United Kingdom had 880,000 dead out of a population of about 44 million. That's over a million. And we're talking about the prime of you know, we're talking almost exclusively men. We're talking about men of military age, mostly between the ages of 18 and 35. So um, it's, it, 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 in fact, it's a lot worse. The First World War is a much more traumatic experience in many ways for the British than the Second World War. I, I mean, there were approximately 370,000 people killed in the Second World War. Obviously, you had the Blitz and uh, etc. But Britain was victorious at the end of it. But here you have this absolutely horrendous sacrifice. Um, and, and not just Britain, we're talking about the, 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 the empire, we're talking about over a million men killed in the empire. And 
you know, how are you ever going to get over that either as individuals or collectively? Everybody knows somebody who's, who's dead. And so you have this incredible period of memorialization after the war. And, you know, it, it, it just goes to show you, I mean, Wilson had spent the previous months unveiling memorials all over the place. He had been to the Somme to unveil the Ulster Tower. He had been to Manchester, he'd been to Belfast. And, you know, this memorialization process was going on all the time. And, you know, we, we're living in a, most, a very less confessional age where people weren't able to articulate their grief much very well. So this was their way to do it, to build these huge memorials. It's a very good point. And also one thing that I wanted to stress is something that I know that you've um, you've said before is that one of the countries, because I suppose when we think about the First World War now, we um, immediately tend to think about Flanders and the trenches and so mm. on. But one of the countries that was most changed was, of course, Ireland. And I think yeah. you've argued that had there not been a war, there wouldn't have been an Easter Rising in no, 1916. Yeah. And if yeah. there hadn't been no Easter Rising, rising there wouldn't have been in turn no, the independence. No. So yeah, that's, that's a very the connection. Important point. Yeah, it's a very important point to make. Um, uh, uh, we 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 were inclined to believe when when the balderdash version of Irish history we were taught in school that the Easter Rising was separate from the First World War. It wasn't. It was an actually event that happened in the First World War. Um, the, uh, the 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 Easter Rising rebels had um, sought guns from the German government um, and had brought them. They were coming to Ireland, but they were they were captured by the Royal Navy. Um, the idea would be to rise up against the British at a time when Britain is 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 um, engaged in the European war, as it were. So yes, it was very much an event in the First World War, and it also explains that when the British um, executed the leaders of the Easter Rising, including Modric Casement, they did so on the basis that uh, that these men had been involved with Her Majesty's enemies at a time of war. So yes, so the Easter Rising then sets in train within, you know, three years, you have the War of Independence, etc. So like the, the First World War is a very, very important event in, in Irish history. I don't think there would have been an independent Irish state but for it. Yeah, massive catalytic event. And you've got this, yeah. this figure who is Irish um, by birth, who... Um, who I think you point, point out is one of the four people credited at the time with yes. being instrumental. So tell us a bit about Sir Henry Wilson, because he's really the figure at the heart. Well, he's, on, he's on the front cover of your book. So let's mm. let's go and go and meet him. What kind of character is he? Well, Henry Wilson is born in Curry Grand, County Longford in 1864. He's born south of the, well, it wasn't a border then, but he was born in the in, in a very nationalist county. Um, his Family are English by origin, but they come over in the 1690s during the William I. Wars, settle in Rashi County Antrim, um, successive generations better than the last one. And Wilson's grandfather becomes quite wealthy. He, through the uh, Crimean War, he's exporting uh, animal products to, to, for, for the Crimean War. He buys a couple of estates in the south of Ireland, moves the family locust to Dublin. And uh, one of these estates is Curry Grain, which is about 1,200 acres outside uh, Ballalee County, Longford. And this is where this is where Wilson grows up. He's Anglo-Irish. Obviously, he goes to Wellington College um, and he has a very um, long winded way of getting into the army. He, he, he fails Sandhurst uh, several times until he eventually gets in uh, by the back door uh, and earns his commission that way. I will, in, in the space of about 40 years, he rises up to become the chief of the Imperial General Staff, which is the principal uh, military advisor to the British government. Uh, he becomes this in February 1918 uh, because Lloyd George has lost confidence in all his other uh, army generals and he believes that Wilson is a very clear sighted thinker and a good explainer and will not try and pull the war over the, the eyes of the political uh, of the British cabinet. So he becomes um, the uh, chief of the Imperial General Staff at a very difficult time in March 1921. Uh, Sorry, in March 1918, uh, the Allies almost lose the war to the German Spring Offensive. They're pushed, uh, the Germans uh, out, out from their supply lines and uh, the Allies push back. At this stage, Wilson answers the fray and he and his good friend Ferdinand Foch 
come together, put together a plan for a supreme allied command, which would facilitate uh, a coordinated attacks against the um, against the Germans. So then you have building up to that in August 19, 1918, you have what's known as the 100 day offensive, where the allies attack on all sides, uh, Belgian, British, French, and of course, the Americans are thrown into the fray and they win the war quicker than most people imagined in November 1918. So at the end of it all, um, Foch, uh, the French Prime Minister Clemenceau, uh, David Lloyd George and, and Henry Wilson are regarded by many as, as the four men who orchestrate this victory in the First World War. And so apart from having this aura of being a bit of a war hero, well, a, a yeah. kind of bona fide war hero, I suppose, um, he's a physically striking presence as well, isn't he? You talk about the wound from the jungle knife that has kind yeah. of slashed down his face. He's got this weeping eye. Um, he He's kind of quite, quite self-deprecating as well, isn't he? He likes to laugh at himself. Is that right? Well, yes, he, he was quite a character. Um, he was six foot four, which was... Uh, um, um, which is uh, which was very tall now, but it was huge for a man of his age. And he, you know, he used that physical, imposing physical presence. Um, the other thing is that he was, um, yeah, he 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 had his eyes smashed with a, 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 a Burmese rod, so he had broken, he had a broken eye socket, and he wasn't the best looking man. In fact, um, somebody once he used to laugh at the fact that somebody sent a letter addressed to the ugliest man in the British Army, and it. It was sent to, to where he was stationed in Belfast at the time. So he was quite an uproarious character. A lot of people said that he was great fun to be around. He was he was a reverend. Uh, he was fun. He was um, very loud and, you know, played up the sort of the paddy sort of thing about him, which is a bit rich. He, uh, he always thought, considered himself to be Irish. And a lot of people attributed the fact that he was not in the slightest bit inhibited to his sort of Irish qualities. He also had other sort of not qualities which people said were not very uh, endearing like he was quite um he was quite slippery he was quite could be quite two-faced and he was quite duplicious and he fell out with a lot of politicians as a result of that he seems to have been a bit of a marmite character there were people who really really loved him and then there were people who really really hated him as well from a military point of view um looking having looked back on this period you obviously know really well do you get the sense that he was one of the great generals of his time? Do you think that's a fair estimation or was he right place, right time kind of character? He, he was. Well, he, he I think I think his greatest achievement really was as director of military operations, which he took over in 1910. He um, correctly surmised how the First World War was going to happen. And he prepared the British Expeditionary Force over the space of about three or four years. And he was banging on about the necessity for um, conscription. He was banging on about the threat from Germany. He was saying that if Britain doesn't get its act together, we're going to face defeat. So what he did was he basically um, he, he he got the the all the logistics and uh, for the British Expeditionary Force, six divisions. That's all there was when there was a million men on both sides, the French and the Germans. He threw them into the fray. These were very, very, very well um, trained, professional, hard soldiers, right? And they they had a devastating impact, greater, far greater than their actual numbers against the Germans. So he had envisaged that they would deploy to the right of the German front or the French front lines, facing the Germans as they as they as they invaded France, and that's exactly what happened. So. Um, he was vindicated in his plan for um, for to deploy the BEF. It was regarded as a masterclass of 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 um, of deployment. Um, during the First World War, he did spend a short amount of time in the field, um, not really long enough to make a value decision about whether he would have been a good field commander. He was spared the fact that he wasn't the guy who was throwing the men into the mincemeat. He wasn't a Douglas Haig or a George Robertson or any of these guys. He was a guy who was behind the scenes trying to sort the logistics out. Um, but um, certainly he his, his role in improving relations and, and uh, between the French and British governments and between the French and British armies was a very, very important factor in the eventual defeat of Germany. Yeah. And it, I mean, everything that you've said here just kind of creates this fine, uh, this fascinating portrait of a person because he's 
centrally involved in the greatest conflict of the time. Mm-hmm. Um, he is born in Longford, you say, in this kind yeah. of pastoral Irish landscape, yeah. um, into a unionist family, and he's got political aspirations, so he's just gone into the House of Commons. And um, there's there's something that Christopher Hitchens, a journalist, once um, said that, that kind of made me think of him, and he said that sometimes fanatism or fanat- I can't even say it properly well the most um, enthusiastic people for empires often come from the periphery and he was um, talking in relation to uh, for example Hitler coming for, from Austria and Stalin Sorry. coming from Georgia Georgia yeah. and um, I, I'm sure these aren't um, comparisons that uh, Henry Wilson would have enjoyed if he'd if he'd heard them but he he does come from um, outside you know kind of old England he's he's from yeah. Ireland but he is very enthusiastic for empire he believes that it's a, a kind of sacred cause is that correct absolutely well i i i, I say in my book that he, his country was the british empire he didn't go consider himself to be english he thought the english were never he says the english are never in, in earnest about anything mm-hmm. he felt there was a fundamental lack of seriousness about english politicians and english life whereas he was um, a southern unionist so yeah. I think that's a really important part of his makeup. It's he's not even a northern unionist; he's a southern unionist, and obviously the Anglo-Irish periphery have had massive influence on 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 the British Empire over the years. I mean, you know, you when you think about the Wellington was Irish as well. Mm. Um, you think about um, uh, Kitchener was was Irish born. John French was of Irish descent. All these guys. So yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting point that Christopher Hitchens makes that. Um, uh, Wilson was from, um, uh, uh, as I said, a Southern Unionist background, which were among the most assiduous um, uh, uh, supporters of the British Empire. And and the fact that they were Irish meant absolutely no difference whatsoever. It's very interesting, the fact, um, when we talk about the Amritsar massacre, that um, there's a a similar assassination in 1940. I don't know if you're aware of it, the... Mm. Uh, it was the subject of a brilliant book by Anita Annan called The Patient Assassin, in which uh, a, a, an Indian separatist assassinates a, a British um, imperial functionary because of what happened in Amritsar in 1919. And this guy isn't killed till 1940. Who is he? He's Sir Michael Dwyer. He's actually an Irish Catholic nationalist from the south of Ireland, but he mm-hmm. was the governor of the Punjab province in, mm-hmm. in, in, in during the Amritsar massacre. So yeah, I mean, the British had a huge role in the British Empire, as did the Scots, as we know as well. Um, and actually, it's only now that people are b- beginning to talk about the Irish involvement in the British Empire. Um, it was always a, the, 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 it was always said that we were the first victims of British imperialism, but we were also, I think, perpetrators in some ways too. Yeah, it's really textured history, really interesting. So I suppose just to kind of kind of look at him in, in Liverpool Street Station would be fascinating in itself because he has an identity that doesn't really exist um, anymore. He's a kind of figure of, of of his time, but this this whole you know the develop the developments in Irish history over the past few years have been in, intensely personal for him because yes. that I suppose alienates him from his his childhood home. He kind of becomes a a kind of placeless person, I suppose. So he is, um, as you say. I mean, I think even towards the end of um, of, the, of the War of Independence, you, you you kind of quantify it at one point and say how kind of dwindling, and just in terms of of, of men and ammunition, the, the the kind of IRA was at that point. Mm. Um, and Wilson is among those who's kind of calling for one last big push. That we can, yeah, we can still. Always, He's not given up, has he? No, he hasn't, and he, he was. Um, I mean, one of the reasons that he he was such a, a figure that inspired enmity in in Ireland was that I think one of the IRA commanders called him an anti Irish Irishman, but he was anti Irish nationalism. Mm. Not quite the same thing, but mm. but it certainly he was against the will of the majority of Irish people at the time. The problem for the British is the same problem that the Russians are facing in Ukraine. So yeah. even if you have, even if you have, say, um, nominally uh, a stronger force, how do you hold people in bondage, so to speak, that don't want you there anymore? Mm. I mean, are you going to be... And so, I mean, it wasn't just a military problem for the British, it was a political problem. Uh, McCready said to Wilson, he said, you know, so what if you put in 40,000 men? Every, every Irish man is a patriot according to his lights from 18 to 60. What are you going to do with all these people when you put them down? Are you going to put them down forever? 
And I mean, you know, as I said, I think there are parallels with Ukraine, even if the Russians were to win some kind of a Pyrrhic victory there. I mean, how are they going to, you know, how, what then? How do you keep, how do you hold the people who don't know? No, I, I completely agree with you. I've been writing about the American War of Independence. It's the same kind of dynamic. You can send more, you know, kind of guns over, but, you know, to what end? Um, well, I could talk more about that, but we should get on to your second scene, which is um, not long after. Where would you like to go next, please? Yes, so the the next uh, <coughs> the next uh, 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 time and place is 36 Eaton Place at about 2.30 p.m. on the same day, June the 22nd, 1922. Um, Wilson leaves uh, Liverpool Street Station. He doesn't really have time to tarry. He wants to go home and change because there's a debate going on in the House of Commons that he wants to attend. So after approximately 1.30, he leaves the station and he gets a, a central line tube and then a taxi from uh, Charing Cross Station stops off in the Travellers uh, Club to pick up his mail, and then he's on his way home in a taxi. And waiting for him there are two uh, veterans of the First World War, Reginald Dawn, who was with the Irish Guards, and uh, Joe Sullivan, who was ex the uh, London Regiment. Joe Sullivan has a wooden leg. He lost his leg at Passchendaele in 1917. Um, Reggie Dawn walks with a slight limp. Um, the two men um, have met at uh, the clock opposite uh, Victoria Station and they walked from there uh, to, to uh, Wilson's home place and they're waiting for him to return home. Um, well, here we come to the point. You mentioned kind of briefly that's something that connected with what we were talking about before. There are two disabled ex-servicemen. That, that's right. I don't suppose they would have been conspicuous because there were many such people around at the time. There were millions of uh, injured British servicemen from the First World War, yeah. Mm, but then, in a way, they seem like quite curious candidates to be carrying out a political assassination because they're not going to be able to get away very quickly. Do you want to tell us what happens um, next? And we'll take the story on a little bit. Well, uh, that that's a very good point. Why would you send uh, two disabled veterans to kill the former head of the British Army? The reason for that is that they were available. Simple as that. Um, there had been uh, there had been a, a, a an order from Ireland, uh, which we can talk about later, to kill Wilson, um, and that order was to be carried out whenever the opportunity arose. And that's really really important uh, to consider that in those days it was much harder to kill somebody than it is nowadays. You didn't have mobile phones. You didn't know where people were from day to day. You didn't have people uh, on social media telling that such and such a politician is here and so on and so forth. So you had to take the opportunities when they arose. So on the night before the assassination, there's a meeting of the IRA and Mooney's pub in Holborn. And uh, somebody walks in with the evening paper and somewhere uh, on the news pages is a single paragraph which states that Henry Wilson is going to unveil a memorial to the men from the Great uh, Eastern Railway Company the following day in Liverpool Street Station. This news is greeted like a thunderclap by the people there because they know that there is, uh, 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 there is a, 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 an assassination um, order to kill Wilson. So uh, Reggie Dawn and Joe O'Sullivan volunteer for this um, activity. They later that evening, they go down to Liverpool Street Station. They realise that it will be an even greater suicide mission to do it at Liverpool Street Station. So they wait for him outside 36 Eaton Place uh, um, that afternoon. And, and what, what in she's there is the start of your book, um, written in this kind of dramatic documentary style. Mm. And it is absolutely predictably chaotic. I mean, the assassination is um, successful. Um, I'll let you talk about that in a moment. But it seems to me um, the kind of messiest, like, kind of story that, that, that could possibly and she does. Do you want, do you want to explain? Messy as in, um, well, just the amount of people that are drawn out onto the streets. Oh, the yes, kind yes. of the melee. Yes. The, 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 I yeah. mean, and it's almost comic in in its kind of tragic, you know, kind of tones. Yeah. I suppose Every, everyone's there. I, I was, I was. Um, so we're looking at Belgravia, you know, which was Dana's now the most expensive place in London. I mean, you know, the houses go there for millions. I mean, it's Russian stand now, but back then it was the place where you know people like Wilson lived. 
So it was a reasonably quiet uh, place, you know. You didn't have the level of of cars, etc., as you have now. I think should we describe it for, our, for maybe for any international or, or, or listeners? I mean, it, it's it is probably where the wealth of London is concentrated. To yeah. it's very close to the centre of political power yes. in Westminster. So yes. there's lots of politicians that would live there. These yeah. kind of great white stucco yeah. uh, tower yeah. houses, kind of you know, yeah. with those big pillars outside it's that kind yeah, of yeah it, it, it's 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 the poshest part of london or one of the most it still is to this day it, it's it's you know and essentially what happens is that they shoot him six times and you know you're not going to get away in a suburban street but shooting somebody six times before somebody um finds out about it unfortunately for don and o'sullivan um there are policemen nearby because um the Gerard street police station is only about maybe 700 yards is certainly within gunshot uh, of of the uh, of 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 the uh, of Eaton place so the two guys they scarper down Eaton place and they are pursued by a policeman named Walter Marsh and they shoot him fortunately they don't kill him uh, but he is uh, he is um left on the sidewalk and then another policeman comes up he's shot as well and by this stage there's a whole posse of people chasing after these two guys um they hire a cab at gunpoint but suddenly uh, as they're uh, entering ebury Eber- street um they're engulfed by this uh, crowd of people they obviously run out of ammunition um they a light from the cab and they try to run away but of course how do you run away with one leg when you've run, you're out of ammunition and both of them are hit over the head one with a truncheon and the other with a bottle and by the time um they're caught there's about 150 people on the scene uh, and the police actually have to save them from being killed on the spot and then they're taken to George Street Station. I kind of reminded I I walked the route and it's a little bit like you know that opening scene in um uh, what do you call it? Uh, that God, the, that, that film was out the night. Uh, Train spot. You remember the opening scene in Train spot where they're running and everybody's running after them down these really grotty streets. I don't know if you've seen it in 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 Edinburgh, but um, this is like a posh version of that. I think if there's ever with a, a film, wooden leg. This, <laughs> it'd be like running through the poshest streets in London with with half of half of London's finest after you. But anyway, they're they're caught right-handed so to speak i mean there's no question of them getting away with it so um yeah uh, i mean how did you a, it kind of raises an interesting point about how you researched it and put it together people might be interested because i suppose there's quite a lot of court records um witness statements and so on there's um i suppose the most vivid story which um comes out of the assassination is the the heroic one of Henry Wilson drawing his sword at the, at the moment of his death? Um, do you want to talk about that for a second? Yeah, there, there's some. Um, uh, yes, there was a there was a, a a story that circulated that that he had his sword out to smote his two assassins, mm. but he never got that far. I mean, yeah. I have been able to get copies of the witness statements that were in the the National Archives in Kew, in which it's clear from the only person, the only reliable eyewitness, as opposed to people who. Have saw it second hand that he didn't get that far he would have reached for a sword but he was killed before um he could he could get it out of the scabbard so and and the and the sword fell uh afterwards it fell out of the scabbard after 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 the the the, the attack um the, the 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 account of the killing is very well documented actually by reggie dunn himself um he wrote about it when he was in prison it was it was um smuggled out um it's about four pages so, um, and it's very, actually very, very well written account. Um, Reggie Dunn was, could have been a, had he lived, he was only 24 at the time, he, he could have been a very accomplished writer himself. Yeah. But that is a matter of a record and his, his account of the shooting is in the military archives, in the Irish military archives here in Dublin. Yeah, I thought Reggie Dunn was actually a very interesting character. He, I mean, he was born, um, I mean, it's a bit topsy-turvy, this, isn't it? Because um, Wilson was born in Ireland. He was born in London. So they're, they're kind of, we're all, I suppose. Well, in, well I mean, it, it's kind of shows the spectrum of Irish uh, Irish identity at that stage mm-hmm. that you have uh, a, a, an Irish-born British imperialist killed by two British-born Irish nationalists. And, mm-hmm. you know, um, it's a very interesting part of the story that many of the diaspora the Irish diaspora living in Britain embraced the cause of Ireland during the during the First World War, as they did in America, Irish America, even to this day, 
is wedded to Ireland um, and, 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 and and Irish independence. So, um, you know, the diaspora would have, even though they lived in the UK, they wouldn't have been particularly enamored a lot of them by Britain, Britain and, and British behavior in Ireland. So you have Reggie Dawn, who is his, his third generation British, actually. I mean, his, his mother, his mother's family from County Monaghan. His father's name is, uh, his father was a band, uh, bandmaster in the British in the British Army, um, and I believe, although I couldn't verify it, that his his grandfather had been in the British Navy. So I mean, you're looking at three or four generations of of living in the UK, and yet here's Reggie Dawn, who is converted to Irish nationalism after the First World War as a, a true Irish culture and music, and he becomes this sworn for the British state. He describes England as the enemy country. And um, it's the same with the O'Sullivans are a different family. They're second generation Irish. Their family are from West Cork, which is the cradle and the heartbeat of the Irish Revolution. It's where Michael Collins is from um, and, and, and many others. And But they, you know, they grow up. There's 11 of them, six of them, uh, six boys, five girls, and five of the boys serve in the First World War. And some of them are injured, as is, uh, you know, Joe Sullivan. And to the extent that when the Home Secretary's handed a brief about about the uh, Wilson shooting, he says this can't have anything to do with Ireland. I mean, look at this family; five of them were serving in the First World War. I mean, they must yeah. be a loyal family. But uh, as we see, um, it, it was a bit more complicated than that. So, I mean, there's nothing. There was absolutely nothing uh, strange or odd about guys who fought for the British Army uh, in the First World War, turning tail and joining the. Um, Joining the, the IRA afterwards. I mean, Tom Barry, who's the most famous IRA commander in the first uh, in the Iowa War of Independence, inflicted the first defeat. Served with the British Army in Mesopotamia. Um, the Carr brothers, uh, who are in my story, who are arch gun smugglers in Britain, they're they're second generation Irish. They joined the IRA. And the most famous is Martin Doyle, called, who won the Victoria Cross. He won the Victoria Cross in 1918. And then a year later, he's joined the IRA. Um, so, um, you know, it's a very complicated story. And I think it's really, really, I think it's kind of, it's, it's very complicated nature makes it even more interesting. As no, it's, I, I think it's absolutely fascinating that you can get the, the kind of progression from the one to the other. Mm. And uh, in a way, Reggie Dunn was a character who, I mean, just... He, he he really is much more than just a hired gun. He's there's there's a lot of depth to him as well. I suppose the only other thing that we should add to this um, the picture of this scene, because um, of course people have to go and read the book if they want to have the full colour. Yeah. But but listen, we're we're so close to the Palace of Westminster where the House yeah. of Commons is sitting. This is where Wilson was supposed to be going had he not been assassinated. The the news does get there even if he doesn't, and you have this. Um, I, I suppose it, it's kind of like this theatrical end to the day where the people are just again in, in pure shock. A member of the house is being shot not far away. And uh, the, the news is kind of filtering in while the house is sitting. Yeah, it, well, the house is sitting. And I think, you know, within three quarters of an hour, um, the House of Commons hears rumours, not confirmed, confirmation, but rumours that, that Wilson has been shot. And... Um, when the confirmation comes through, Austin Chamberlain, who's a Conservative Party leader at that stage, is asked, where's your information? Have you got any information for us? And eventually he tells the House that, that Wilson has been shot dead. And, you know, Wilson Wilson is on first name terms with all the members of the British cabinet. Yeah. They all know who he is. I mean, they would have fallen out with him over Ireland. But during those years... You know, when when during the First World War, he was in and out of of of, of conferences with Lloyd George and Chamberlain and, yeah. and and Churchill and that. So, I mean, the the, the shock is it, it's personal. It's yeah. almost personal to the people who are in the, the, the House of Commons. And, you know, they, they had lived in fear that the, the British cabinet had lived in fear of assassination during the War of Independence. But once the treaty was signed, the barriers came up uh, from uh, on Downing Street. They had been there because of the IRA threat. The, the security detail was gotten rid of, etc. And suddenly you have when you think you have got rid of the Ireland problem, suddenly you have this brazen shooting dead on the streets of London. Of, of the former head of the British Army. It, it really is a, an absolutely shocking event in, yeah. in British history. And bear in mind that the last time uh, an incident like this had happened had been 1812 when Spencer Percival, the Prime Minister, was killed. Yeah, 
exactly. It's it's but that that particular scene in the in the House of Commons is a bit like when you've stubbed your toe and you've not felt the pain. It's that kind of in between moment when people are just like reeling almost. But I suppose one last question I've got to ask you because it's occurred to me and it's an interesting one is had um, Henry Wilson not been assassinated, did you do you think a high level political career awaited him? Was he going to be a cabinet member at least? Might have been even more than that. Um, there was there was talk at that stage. There's a, you're asking me the counterfactual. What would have happened to Herr Wilson um, if 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 he had if he had lived? Well, there's actually a book about produced about that in the 1960s called The Lost Dictator by Bernard Ash, and he imagines that had Wilson lived, that he would have taken over the right wing of the Tory Party. Um, he was a close confidant of uh, Andrew Bonner Law, became the Prime Minister in October 1922. And that he could have uh, risen up to become a sort of Mussolini type Hitler type figure. I don't think that would ever have happened myself. Um, I think that uh, there was too much distrust of Wilson for him ever to get to that position. But I mean, had he lived, he was he was a guy. He was, 58, was, wasn't he? He wasn't that old. I mean, he was, he was only 58, five, you know, yeah. and he had made a big impression in the House of Commons in the short time he had been there. Mm-hmm. Now, he was regarded as an extremist in relation to Ireland by by many, many, many people and liberal minded people. But, you know, bear in mind at that stage that there was still a coalition government in charge and Lloyd George was the prime minister. But prime, Lloyd George was a liberal. He was and the, 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 the conservatives actually had a majority and there was a lot of them were itching to get rid of 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 Lloyd George. And in fact, they did later in 1922. Hence the name of the 22 uh, committee. You know, this was the original idea of getting rid of the liberal uh, liberals. So I don't know what is his his uh, the end result would have been for him. Um, as I said to you, Bernard Ash's book is really good. He feels that. Yeah. Uh, when, when Not a massively shot. consoling narrative, though, is it? <laughs> no, no, they, they feel clear. that when they when 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 Wilson was killed, that really... that 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 that, uh, that a very potentially dangerous politician had been got rid of in Britain as well as in Ireland. We'll we'll put a link to that on the website. It sounds like a really fascinating book. I think I might read it myself. Um, we've got one more scene that we we we're going to have a look at before we finish off, and um, we're going to cross the sea. Where are we going to go to? So uh, this is um, August the 22nd, two months to the day after the um, assassination of Henry Wilson. The time is approximately 8, 8, 8, 8.45 p.m. There's a dusk settling. We're in Bail Nabla, which means the mouth of the flowers in West Cork. Now, there's a, there's a, a massive political figure that we've not yet spoken about, but we're going to go and have a look at him now. And um, I, I think it's fair enough if I mention his name, Michael Collins, who um, at this time, 100 years ago, now as we sit here in 2022, I mean, he was, you know, kind of a figure that everyone had an opinion about, everyone knew, and he, one of those few politicians who had made real change. Um, obviously, everyone in Ireland still knows about him, but just kind of, could you talk about Michael Collins in in the briefest and um, kind of most revealing way you can? Because I think it's just worth to, to nip back. Okay, well, I think I'm fair to say that Michael Collins is probably the one Irish revolutionary everybody's heard about. Um, he was the subject of a Hollywood film in 1996, uh, directed by Neil Jordan, starring Liam Neeson. He was um, generally regarded as the um, Ireland's great lost leader. Um, he was uh, he was 1916. He had he actually had for, spent his formative years living in London, uh, where he had worked as a bank clerk and uh, in the civil service. He came back to Ireland in 1916 to fight in the Easter Rising. He rose up uh, through the ranks to become the head of IRA intelligence during the War of Independence, in which he orchestrated the assassination uh, of of many of the uh, British intelligence agents in Ireland um, in 1920, during Bloody Sunday 1920. He was regarded as um, a legendary figure almost in Ireland. Uh, He had was credited with orchestrating the War of Independence against the British. He wasn't the only one, but he was the person who most people reckoned uh, uh, was the head of the army, the IRA, that, that, that brought the British to the negotiating table in 1921. He was young, he was dynamic, he was brilliant. He had been the Minister for Finance in the Irish government. He was also uh, the, uh, the uh, Chief of Staff of the, the, the National Army, which was set up after independence. 
He supported, he was one of the negotiators of the Anglo-Irish Treaty in 19, December 1921. He signed the treaty because he believed famously that it was not the um, be all and end all, but it was the freedom to achieve freedom. But so he felt that by signing up to the treaty that Ireland could, um, uh, an, an independent Irish state could work towards becoming a, an independent Irish Republic. It was his personal influence and um, that caused the treaty to be actually narrowly supported by the Irish Parliament in January 1922. Um, he was at the uh, at the time of the um, Wilson shooting, the chairman of the provisional government in Ireland, and he was also um, a, a quite a, a duplicitous figure himself. Even though he supported the treaty and literally put his life on the line for the treaty, he did not support the partition of Ireland. He worked behind the scenes to undermine the new Northern Irish state. Uh, he, he fomented a, 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 an, IRA, um, uh, an IRA campaign against the new Northern state in, in May and June uh, 1922, which was a failure as the um, British had far too much resources to, to, to throw against the IRA. But generally speaking, he was a celebrity. I mean, he was a handsome man. He was uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel of Irish uh, revolutionary life. He had very much the same role as that kind of romantic image of Che Guevara would have nowadays with a certain amount of radicals. So um, yeah, he was probably the most famous man, Irish man at that time. Um, yes, so he's also somebody who, um, uh, when well, we can come on and we can talk about the the, the, the how how the Wilson shooting led to the 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 the, the, the um, Irish Civil War, but well, he is the leader of the pro treaty uh, uh, National Army in the Irish Civil War. Yeah, I mean, on the I mean, just to tweak one of your last points, you said he was the most famous man in Ireland. He's the most infamous man in Britain. You also write because he had this kind of puckish quality of never being able to quite pin him down. He always seemed to survive um, all events. And um, yeah. it's interesting that he is actually connected on the day um, of Wilson's assassination because Lloyd George, you write, um, communicates with him that, that evening. And um but because, of course, he's a go-to person in Ireland for the, the British government, of course. Um, but what kind of impact on his life did that assassination in that Belgravian street have? It, it ended his life. Um, I mean, the shots that were fired in Belgravia uh, led on to the shot that, fired, that was fired at Bail and on the 22nd of August. And... Just to put you in the picture, I suppose, um, the Wilson shooting is most significant in Ireland for being, I described it in my book as the Sarajevo moment for Irish history. As you know, uh, as a historian, that the uh, uh, the assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand leads on in turn to the ultimatum that the Austrians give to Serbia and Germany lines up with, with Austria and Russia lines up with Serbia. And suddenly from this random event in the Balkans, you have within 37 days, the entire European continent is at war. Um, something of the same analogy is, is, is at play here, right? So uh, the as I, I spoke to you earlier about the split that was caused by the treaty, uh, by the signing of the treaty in 1921, there are those like Collins who believe it is the freedom to achieve freedom. There are others like the anti-treaty side who believe it's a sellout. And um, there's no meeting of minds about all of this. And in uh, April 1922, the anti-treaty side uh, IRA splits from the pro-treaty IRA. It occupies the four courts, which is the main courts of justice in Ireland, the Old Bailey of Dublin. And um, there they are in situ for the next six or seven weeks. And at the same time, um, uh, there's a, a general election called in Ireland. This is the first in the, the history of the new state. And Sinn Féin, of course, is split over the treaty, as, as is the IRA. So it is the side, De Valera, Eamon De Valera, who's the head of the anti-treaty side, Michael Collins is head of the pro-treaty side. They decide to field candidates according to their respective um, strength in the, in, in, in the outgoing doll, which is the Irish Parliament. And um, the British don't like this. The British feel that what's going to end up at the end of all of this is a Sinn Féin government with ministers who are in power, who uh, do not support the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And part of the part of 
the stipulation in the treaty, Article 17 says, if you want to be in power in Ireland, you have to accept the treaty. And also they feel that the, the Irish government has been far too indulgent towards the rebels who are in the forecourt. So as a result of that, when the Wilson shooting happens, um, the two guys are caught, Reggie Dunn and Joe Sullivan, and uh, Lloyd George claims that there are papers found on Reggie Dunn, uh, which link Reggie Dunn with the anti-treaty side in the forecourts. So that evening, um, uh, uh, Lloyd George sends a letter to Collins saying to him, if you do not deal with the rebels in the four courts, we will uh, do it for you. Bear in mind here that um, the British haven't completely left Ireland at this stage. You still have a garrison of 6,000 troops in, uh, in Ireland. They also have access to uh, the Royal Navy and access to the RAF. So this is a very serious threat. Uh, that the Lloyd George has um, um, shouldered on the Irish government. The Irish government plays for time for a few days. Uh, Neville McCready, the officer commanding the British forces in Ireland, is summoned to London. He tries to tell the, Brit the, the British cabinet that if they start a war again with Ireland, that they'll never get out of it. But in the end of the day, the, the ultimatum, the sort of gun to the head of the provisional government works. And the Irish government, um, the provisional government, um, decides to deal with the uh, Four Courts rebels using uh, borrowed uh, British artillery. So they shell the Four Courts on the 28th of June, and that's the start of the Irish Civil War. And it's not, as you say, it's what, 40, 40 days from Princip to the start of the First World War. 37 Maybe days. 37 yeah. days. We're talking about like a 60 day period now between these two shootings. 60 days. Six days, six days. So no, no, yeah. between the, the the two assassinations, between um, what happened to Wilson and what happened to Collins. On yeah, the... it's exactly two months later. Yeah. So, um, so Wilson. A really is... interesting parallel. I think that's a good way of yeah, describing and... it and thinking about all of these forces are just kind of unleashed, and it's a lot of it's emotion, isn't it? Yes. Well, I think that um, the analogy I make is is our old world friend, the, the powder keg. If powder keg, if a powder keg is in a in a sealed room. It's it's harmless till somebody lights the fuse. So I mean, you know, the the analogy is 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 right with the First World War. There was a powder keg, but nobody had lit the fuse until until Archduke Franz Ferdinand was killed. Similarly, with the Irish experience, there was this this deadly, well, not deadly, but this 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 standoff between the pro and anti treaty sides, both in terms of military uh, and and the political wings. But it wouldn't necessarily have led to civil war because neither side had prepared for civil war. But thrown into the mix now is the British ultimatum to the provisional government. So the provisional government is left in a very difficult situation. Either it deals with the Four Courts rebels or it has to deal with the British government. And as it turns out, um, you know, the provisional government was coming in the direction, was going in the direction of, well, we are going to have to deal with this situation in the Four Courts sooner rather than later. We can't go on like this. And it wasn't just the Four Courts either. There was a lot of unrest between pro and anti treaty. Uh, forces in Ireland at that time. And also the last thing I would mention in relation to this is I mentioned before that there was a general election on the 16th of June. Pro-treaty candidates got almost 80% of the votes. So here was a here was the fact that the provisional government had what they didn't have before the June 16th election, which was a mandate from the people. So Michael Collins, I mean, that, that he is as i said before he has this reputation for being able to get through you know to kind of remove himself from scrapes there's a there's um a headline i think this is from the illustrated london news you quote from and they said there was a time not so long ago when michael collins was regarded as almost a myth so elusive was he in escaping a capture and um this just seems to create a scenario which even he cannot get out of i mean on this day um, I'll let you just describe what happens in in a second. But um, has he let his guard down, or is he a dead man walking? Well, he's a bit of both, really. But um, uh, the, as this, just to get back to the war, the war starts on June the twenty eighth. It's over on the thirtieth of June. The, the four four court siege siege is over. Then we start with the Battle of Dublin, which lasts six days, and so. Um, Slowly but surely, the pro-treaty side get on top of the anti-treaty side and take the major towns in the south of the country, uh, Limerick, uh, Waterford and, and Cork fall in turn. And so the anti-treaty side reverts to what uh, the IRA did to the British 
army during the uh, War of Independence, they they uh, they they revert to guerrilla warfare. But Collins is down in his native Cork um, on the 22nd of August trying to make peace. He's hopeful that he can get the anti-treaty and pro-treaty uh, sides together. Um, it's clear that the, the anti-treaty side can't win, but he wants to persuade them to lay down their arms. So he is um, does an inspection in West Cork, which is still an anti-treaty stronghold, but he, uh, he he's asked about this before, and he says, sure, they'll never shoot me in my own county, you know? So he was quite, he was quite cavalier about his own safety in relation to this. He uh, he's driving around the entire day. It starts at six a.m., and he's spotted by some anti-treaty uh, uh, sentries. Uh, but he drives on uh, oblivious to everything. But and most of the ambush are waiting for him to return back to Cork City. They um, they've cleared off for the evening, leaving three or four guys in situ overlooking. Bail and Blah, which is a bendy part of the road between Bandon and uh, McCroom. Anyway, um, so at 8.45 p.m., um, the entourage, uh, Colin's entourage is, is driving down the road and they're, the ambush starts and Collins gets out of the car that he's in, the, the armoured car that he's in, and he starts returning fire and he is shot uh, through the head um, by we don't know who yet, although we have there's been speculation about that last for the last hundred years. He's the only fatality of this ambush, and he's dead uh, at the age of 31. It's a desperate tragedy for Ireland, um, and I think the whole history of Ireland would have been different had he lived. It's, it's an absolutely. I mean, you've, I mean, you've done something tremendous over the last hour, which has distilled so much history into into the, into our podcast format. But um, really, what it is, I mean, these are completely um, formative moments, and you can see how one leads to, to the other. But but drawn together, they make the most dramatic and um, kind of consequential story that I suppose people are still coming to terms with now. I mean, a hundred years on. I mean, it's it's kind of we often do anniversaries on this mm. podcast, but we don't often hit anniversaries quite so closely because I think we're yeah. going to release this next Tuesday, which is almost a yeah. hundred years to the day. Yeah. Maybe it's one day off yeah. or something. Um, I haven't checked, but how? I mean, is is anything going on um, that you would like to tell us about with regards to these two assassinations in either country that you? <clears throat> yes, well, would kind yes, of explain indeed. how people are dealing with the story now. Well, there has been a campaign for many years to uh, get uh, Henry uh, Wilson a shield in the House of Commons. Um, he's the only MP who was assassinated by Irish Republicans that doesn't have a shield. And that is going to be remedied on the centenary of his death in the House of Commons. Uh, the um, Speaker of the House of Commons will unveil a shield to Wilson in the House of Commons um, chamber. And there's also, uh, I believe, the uh, a painting of um, Wilson is going to be given to the Somme uh, Centre in, in Northern Ireland. Um, so far as uh, Ireland is concerned, um, we're going to have a lot of commemorations around the Civil War. I'm speaking myself at a conference later this week, the big national conference in, um, in Cork. And there is a whole week of activities in uh, in Cork in August, surrounding uh, Bail and Abla, the centenary of Wilson or of, of Collins's death, and I think that's going to be one of the biggest events that Ireland has had in the last ten years of commemorations. It's it's fascinating. So, last question that I can throw at you before I let you escape this, and it is a bit of material history. If you could bring one object back from 1922, either as a reminder of this conversation or as probably more likely as a history at large, what would mm. you like? I think I would bring back uh, Wilson's ceremonial sword. Um, I think it's indicative of, uh, you know, a life cut short, a man who, you know, literally lived by the sword and died by the sword, wow. as did Reggie Dunn and Joe Sullivan. In fact, so many protagonists that are relevant to this story, Michael Collins, uh, Cahal Brewer, um, some of the guys who were involved in assassination planning in the UK before, um, before Wilson was assassinated, they all died. So, I mean, 
you know, the ceremonial sword is, uh, to me, symbolizes the fact that if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And it's, and a, all and it's a cautionary and, object, isn't it, as well? Um, but but reflective of so much. Well, listen, I've learned a lot talking to you today. Really, really enjoyed it. Good luck with the book. And I'm, I'm going to kind of keep my eye out to see what happens over the next few months during these commemorations. So thank you very much for coming on Travels. I'll, I'll keep you posted. And thank you so much for your time, Peter. I really appreciate it. So that was me, Peter Moore, talking to Ronan McGreevy about this book. And I'm going to hold it here so you can get a good look at it. It's called uh, Great Hatred, The Assassination of Sir Henry Wilson, MP, just published now by Baber. And um, about as topical as you can imagine, because we're 100 years after the event right now. Much, much more as ever is on our website, which is tttpodcast.com. Thank you for listening today. I hope you join us again very, very soon. Bye-bye.